Okay, good morning, everybody. So it's my great pleasure that I can <laughs> we can start so KGI lecture series. Today we could invite so two outstanding scientists from US and uh, Dr. Hon Johnson and uh, also Wally Min, so from the University of Pennsylvania. So okay, uh, okay, let me uh, okay, uh, start the introducing the, uh, the Professor Hon Johnson first. Okay, so. Um, um, <clears throat> Also, Hong Jun Sun, okay, so graduated the uh, Peking University in 1992. So it's the uh, best university in China. And so he did, so he moved then, moved to the US and did so master course training near uh, the Columbia University under the mentor of the uh, Professor Mu Min Pu. Mu Min Pu is uh, currently is a director of the uh, mm. Shanghai Neuroscience Institute. So, the uh, most famous and best neuroscientist in, in China, because as you know. So, and so, okay, uh, amazingly, he moved to the, uh, uh, just moved to the UC San Diego, and so his PhD is at the UC San Diego. Okay, this time also, okay, so he has a trend in the Mumin lab. And then, okay, 1998, he started postdoc in Soap Institute, and so he worked with Rusty uh, Gage, uh, Fred Gage, and also on uh, Chuck Stevens, well, the two giants of the neuroscience okay, in Soap Institute. And then he got independent to 2000. Okay, he joined the faculty at uh, Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. And so he worked there until uh, the second. until 2016, and so uh, and then he moved to the uh, uh, UPenn, the current position, 2017. So now he is a director of the uh, neuroepigenesis, so the uh, interest group of the epigenetics institute of, of the U UPenn. Now, okay, so, uh, Dr. Hong jong Song is uh, very well known. He's a, a prominent work about so regulation of the adult neurogenesis, and re recently, so, uh, the molecular and cellular okay, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, detail analysis of the uh, gliomas. Okay, so uh, today he talks about uh, uh, epitranastomic regression of the mammalian cortical neurogenesis. Hold on, please. <laughs> Okay, uh, great. Well, thanks so much for, for the invitation to come here to visit Japan again. Um, uh, as I mentioned, my lab um, work on a, a number of topics. Uh, we've been working on down neurogenesis for the past 20 years, and, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, and this actual project was started, uh, we work on a DMS, DMS in the lab. So that was the project of my first graduate student. Um, as you probably don't know, I was trained as an electrophysiologist. So as a graduate student and postdoc, I was mainly only doing electrophysiology recording in, in cell cultures. And many of all this stuff was really driven by my graduate student. They, they really come in and they are interested in other topics and then we start to work on this. So today I'm gonna to tell you um, a few stories and, and look at uh, a modification of RNA and using a nervous system as, as example. So, as you all know, uh, the, the information goes from the DNA to RNA to protein. And uh, as Zawal established that, the DNA and the protein can be uh, modified, can be modified. So you heard about DNA isolation, uh, the cytosine can be methylated, the protein can be also phosphorylated, and there are many, for example, histone uh, proteins can be really modified in many different ways. And that's the, the, the epigenetics modification. And the RNA kernel also can be modified. And we actually know for a long time that there are over 170 different type of modifications in RNA. And this actually become very, very famous and recently. So they become a, really a new field called epitranscriptomics. So it turned out there are many, many different versions and RNA can be modified. That could be R tRNA, RNA, or a message RNA. Probably the most famous example is the modification of pseudo-U. Uh, I don't know if you heard about that, is 
for RNA vaccine, actually, probably everybody got it for the COVID-19 vaccine, mRNA vaccine, the RNA are modified. So they are modified with pseudo U to increase stability and decrease the immunogenicity and the speed to enhance the therapeutic effect. So really, RNA modification has made a huge impact on, on uh, human health. And also uh, now uh, over the last probably five, six years, uh, we start to get to understand what the RNA uh, modification are doing in, in the intact uh, systems, including the nervous system. So RNA can be modified in different ways. Uh, they, they can regulate the metabolism RNA in different ways. For example, they can control the RNA export, translation, stability, and uh, other effects. So today I'm gonna to tell you um, uh, two different type of modifications. And the first one is called M6A modification. So M6A modification is the most abundant internal uh, modification of uh, RNA. And this happens uh, across our uh, sort of RNA, but mostly uh, centered the modification happens near the stop codon. We do not really know exactly why yet, uh, but there's some models suggesting why this actually happens in the stop codon. And uh, people have identified the molecular machineries uh, control this process. So one of the uh, transferase complex is called the MEDA3 and the MEDA14. They can add M16 modification to mRNA. And this process can also be dynamic. So which means they can be de uh, demethylated and the two demethylates, FTO and uh, LKBH5. So they can remove the M16 modification. When the uh, M16 will add to the RNA, now you can have a different uh, functional consequences. And these consequences are mediated by different reader proteins, which means there are different proteins which can bind to this modified mRNA and lead to different uh, downstream functional consequence. And this could be nuclear export, splicing, translation, uh, stability, and localization. So uh, we started the project uh, around 2015 at the time at that time, most of the study was done in cell lines. So people use cell lines to study uh, uh, sort of the abundance of this modification, where did it happen, and how do they control the RNA metabolism. We wanted to do in the intact nervous system to look at in vivo what's the function and mechanism of this modification uh, in the intact nervous system. So this is a project uh, uh, done by Ke Jung Young. Uh, now he actually uh, started his own. Uh, he started a few years ago now in his own lab in KAIST in South Korea. And what we did is, is uh, we tried to knock out the, the, the right protein in the nervous system. So we got the mice uh, uh, from uh, Trunky, the meta-14 flux mice, then we crossed them with nesting to delete this in the nervous system. And what you can see here is basically, uh, this is new bull mice uh, and then the mice are smaller. And over time, we find almost all the knockout mice died within 25 days at first. So this is just in, uh, a meta protein or M6A signaling is essential for life uh, in the postnatal age. To look into uh, sort of a little bit what happened to the nervous system, and, and occasionally initially just look at uh, a P5, uh, postnatal day five, look at the brain, a uh, uh, sort of a coronal section. And what you can see right away is when he stayed for the markers for PAC6, which is a marker for a neural stem cells in the developing cortex. And normally in the postnatal stage, by this time, uh, you, you do not see much markers for uh, neural stem cells anymore. So they become depleted uh, after neurogenesis, developmental neurogenesis. But to our surprise, uh, we see a dense layer of PAC6 positive, um, uh, PAC6 positive uh, cells in the ventricle, just like the dividing uh, cortex. And if we stain them in a, a little bit higher uh, modification detail, and you can see this uh, cell still have this radio morphology as a uh, GFP and nesting fibers. So those are, are sort of indication that they're still in neural stem cells. So uh, we did a quantification. Uh, you can see from embryonic stages to early postnatal stages, normally in the wild type animals, and the PAC6 positive neural stem cells decrease over time, and they're pretty much depleted by P P5. Uh, but then in the knock animals, there's still a lot of neural stem cells uh, reside in the region, suggesting there's some uh, changes in embryonic neurogenesis. So this led us to look into what happens in embryonic stages. So we'll move one step earlier to the system. And this is done by Caroline Weiser. Now she's also a faculty uh, at the UCSF, uh, studying her own lab. And what we did is looking into the cell cycle characteristics of uh, neural stem cells at this stage, to look what happened uh, in the knockout animal. And the first set experiment they did is label the dividing cells with the EDU and then wait for two hours 
So look at what cells now I go from S phase, a transition into the M phase. So using PH3 as a marker. So when they're double positive, and that's suggesting they already go from S phase to M phase. And what we find that is in the wild animals, there's about 80% of them already transition to, to the um, M phase, but in the knock animals, they're much less. Suggesting the cell cycle progression is delayed, is slower in, in the knock animals. In addition, we're also looking into cell cycle exit. So the study was done by label dividing cells with the EDU, then wait for 24 hours later, a stay for cells to see whether they're still in the cell cycle using KS67 as a marker. So for the cells which are EDU positive, but KS67 negative, that means the cells were dividing one day before, then one day later, they exit the cell cycle. And you can see again, in the knock animals, such cells, the cells exit the cycle is much, much less. Suggesting again, there's a delay of cell cycle uh, progression in the knockout animals. To really uh, be sure there's a cell cycle uh, deficit, um, uh, Caroline did is did a time lapse imaging. So he basically, she basically using a marker, uh, using transfect the cells, uh, neoprogenic cells in the dish, where they can use different colors to indicate which phase of cell cycle they are, and did a time lapse imaging. And indeed, what she finds is that uh, basically, the SG2 and M phase transition is almost double in the knock animals. So what they're suggesting then is, is this, uh, everything seems to be slower down in, in the knock animals, where cell cycle progression is slower, and that can explain why we still have residual neural stem cells in the post uh, postnatal brain. Is everything seems to be slower. So looking into the molecular mechanism, uh, Francisca, and now she's doing post in Munich. And did sort of uh, to looking for what type of RNA attacked by m 6 a So she did assay where she used antibody to, uh, to uh, pull down m 6 a containing mRNA and did uh, sequencing. And what she found is that actually uh, sort of to our delight, uh, what she found is that many of the molecules we know are involving your stem cells and your genesis and cell cycles are attacked by m 6 a So for example, many genes involving cell cycles, uh, uh, are involved the CDK genes, uh, part of the M6A tag. There are many genes are involved in uh, stem cell differentiation and neuron generations, for example, uh, um, SOX2, PAX6, NeuroD2, and many of them are also uh, attacked by uh, M6A. So this suggesting then uh, is really the M6A signaling can really can control uh, the part of the, uh, the neural stem cell cell cycle progression as well as potentially the fate of these cells. Um, because these are all tagged together. So all this is done in the mouse system. So we also want to know what happened in the human system. So in the lab, we have two model systems. You're going to hear more from Gordy later, is we have a 2D system where we, we start from uh, induced pluripotent of human embryonic stem cells. And using targeted approach, we can differentiate them in the cortical neural stem cells in a dish. In a relative very few population, almost 99 to 100% of them uh, are cortical neural stem cells. So for this, we can also use the lentivirus and to uh, manipulate them. And so when we knock down meta-14 in these cells, what we see is again, we see a decrease of cell cycle, a slowdown of cell cycle progression, just like in the mouse um, in vivo. The second model we have is called a uh, so-called full brain, uh, brain organoid model. So these are 3D models. You can hear a lot more uh, from Goli later. Is using this system, we can also manipulate uh, the neural stem cells are using either virus or electroporation. So basically, uh, we can manipulate uh, the, the sort of neural stem cell layers, just like in the mouse, uh, using electroporation or, uh, or a virus. And then you can see here, again, we see a delayed of cell cycle progression. So this is suggesting there's really conserved cell biology. At the cell biology level, uh, the impact of the meta-14 uh, m 6 a signaling is really well conserved. They change the cell cycle neural stem cells and leave a delayed of their development. We also did a sequencing to looking for what are the M6A targets uh, in the human system. So in this case, uh, we sequenced the, the four brain organoid at the stage uh, uh, in visual, very similar to the mouse at E34.5. At this stage, they are mostly uh, neural stem cells. And uh, uh, to sort of validate our data for those four brain organoid, we also use the uh, sort of fetal uh, human brain uh, tissue, the post conception week 11. And this is also very similar to the stage of full brain organoid. So we did a sequencing for all of them. Uh, I sort of look at the overlap of the genes, which has m 6 signaling uh, tagging. And we find uh, there's a sort of overlap of over 800 genes, which are tagged by M6A. 
So these are tagged by M6A in all three species. And those genes are involved in cell cycle, new stem cell, new genesis. But to our surprise, and what we find is that it's basically in the human organoid or in human brain, and the, num the number of genes or number of MRAs tagged by M6A is much, much higher. Right? You can see in the mouse, is less than 2,000 of them, but in humans, there are about over 3,000 transcripts attacked by M6A, suggesting M6A signaling could be much more prominent in human model than in the mouse. In addition, uh, we, we find this sort of uh, over a thousand transcripts are shared by the organoid and human fetal tissue, the M6A tag, but they're not M6 tag in the mouse. So these are uniquely tagged in the human brain, but not in the mouse. Although the genes are uh, all expressed in all three systems. Hey, when we look into these genes, and what we find that many of them actually are linked to uh, uh, human brain diseases. For example, here shows the genes. Uh, if you look at uh, the, the, the orange and red ones, they attack only, uh, the blue ones attack only in humans, and many of them are involving uh, autistic spectrum disorders, schizophrenia. Uh, so, so many of the genes eventually affect by uh, hum, uh, affect human a brain development involving brain disorders, even involving Alzheimer's disease attacked by M6A. So this is an interesting question, whether M6A can play a fundamental role also affect human brain development and involving brain disease. So that's something we're very interesting to look uh, uh, now. So this all tells us what are the transcripts attacked by M6A, but the next we want to know is what is the function of M6A? and how M6A actually can, uh, can impact the metabolism of MRA. As I mentioned at the introduction, uh, the, the impact of M6A is mediated by the reader proteins and eventually look into, uh, can change different metabolic state of RNA involving uh, nuclear export, splicing, translation, stability, and localization. So the first thing we, we look is, is the stability because the stability has the most prominent effect uh, studied in, in the cell lines, including the cancer cell lines. So in this, we did the uh, RNA stability assay. So the way we did is we take the neural stem cell in the dish from wild type, and knock, uh, wild type animals and knock animals, and then we block the de novo transcription with a drug, actinomycin. And then we did a sequencing at the beginning and five hours later. So basically during these five hours, the RNA decay. We want to look at uh, the, the speed of RNA decay. So for this, we'll look at ratios of Gene expression at five hours over at zero hour. So the larger the numbers, the more stable the, the transcripts are. And then we divide the transcript into two groups. The one we know has M6 attack and the one doesn't. So basically uh, based on M6 signaling. And what you can see here in the white type case, you can see uh, the non tag M6 transcripts, which has a higher ratio, suggesting they're more stable. And on the other hand, M6 tag version are much less stable. So this suggesting that is M6A can promote RNA decay. And if you look at the knockout animals, you can see these two curves actually uh, sort of uh, uh, merge together, suggesting this is really is, M uh, is M6A dependent phenomena. And we can look at individual cases. You can see many of the genes, for example, TBR2, NeoD1, NeoD2, is really the, the half-life is increased in the knockout animals, suggesting normally uh, this transcript get rapid degradation uh, because M6 is tagged. And this is actually well, sort of, at the same time, when we published our paper, another paper came out uh, in genome research, uh, genome biology, and they find uh, that one of the reader proteins called the YTHDF2, and they find they also are uh, involved in uh, RNA decay and, and new development in mice. So it's actually these two together really suggesting it is the RNA decay uh, mediate uh, some of the effect in, in delay of neurogenesis in, in, in the mouse. So what's actually caught up notice, uh, sort of attention, which is a little bit surprised to us, is that uh, the, in general, the model we taught in the textbook uh, over years is that a neurogenesis, a cortical neurogenesis is really well uh, sort of uh, delineated process. It started with neural stem cells, for example, marked by PAC6, then it goes to intermediate precursor cells uh, uh, for amplification involving TBR2, and then you transition in post-metallic neurons such as neural, uh, neural D. In this case, really, NeoD has been used a marker for post mitotic neurons. So this seems to be a sequential but separated process. But to our surprise, when we look into our RNA uh, sequencing data, we find that many of the genes, for example, TBR2, intermediate progenitor cells, even NeoD1, are tagged by M6A 
they're also well expressed in the neural stem cell stage. So basically it means these genes are well expressed here. Uh, eventually, I think there's a lot of data in the literature. People find this before, but basically they feel this doesn't make a lot of sense. So that's why they, they never look at this. And this actually caught up attention because this suggesting that is, it could be this uh, patterning genes involved in later process could be expressed very, very early. They can be controlled by M6A uh, uh, secularly. And that indeed is the case. And what we find that, for example, if you look into a TBR2 in the immediate previous cells uh, together with PAC6, you can see in the wild animal, there's very few of them co-express them. So this is sort of in a stage where they are in the mix of neural stem cell in the immediate transition stage. But if you look at that in the knock animals, this percentage is much, much higher. And the same is true for neural D1. So even in the case of PAC6, these are neural stem cells, uh, positive cells, and uh, now they actually already express some certain neural D1. And this number is dramatic increased in, in the case in the knock animals. So this led us to propose a new model, which you actually uh, would did not realize before, it's called pre-patterning. So what this is suggesting that the process of neurogenesis from stem cells or the neurons actually is well occurred in a way that many of the genes in the later stage of development, for example, neurons or even uh, IPCs in neurons, they are very well expressed in the stem cells. The cells are ready, are preparing them to the next stage. They already express these transcripts. But those transcripts go through active degradation because M6A. So this way they never show up in, in the level of proteins, uh, much lower. So we think this is really tell something fundamental about uh, neurogenesis process is the cell are committed to become neurons much, much earlier than we saw. And they're pre-patterned in a way. And epitranscriptum can provide the speed. So this is way where you can, uh, don't need to change the transcription. You can just control the RNA translation as a methodology as approach to really turn around the neuronal thing. And extend this model, we actually proposed that there's really a pre-patterning across the neurogenesis process through both epitranscriptome and, uh, and epigenetic mechanism. So basically you're starting with a uncommitted progenitor cells or neural stem cells. And the first step is you can pattern them epigenetically. You change Compton architectures. At this stage, they are already committed to become uh, certain lineages but they do not express the gene yet. So basically they have the competent state, allow them to express the gene, but they do not express the gene yet. At the stage of limited committed, at this stage, they already started, although they are still progenitor stem cells, they already start to express the transcripts for the downstream lineages, such as neurons or intermediate precursor cells, but they mostly do not turn into proteins. And because of two mechanisms, uh, one mechanism I mentioned is really because of the RNA degradation through the M6A. There's another mechanism was identified by Fred Miller's group in Canada, and they find that many of them is not only sort of this degradation of RNA, what they find is that many of these transcripts cannot be translated because of negative mechanism. So there's inhibition of protein translation. And only later on at this stage now, and then later when they really went through all the developmental process, they become neurons, they start to express all these genes fully to, to show the phenotype. And the pre-patterning really can explain many of the sort of the process, how this gradually changed the state, both uh, epigenomically and uh, uh, transcriptionally, allow the cells progress from the stem cell all the way to, uh, to final product. And by what this suggests to us is that many of the patterning actually happens much, much earlier. Basically by the early stages, although they do not show any markers for later stage uh, cell type, they are fully committed, they are already patterned. So the implication of this is really is involving our, how, how we try to differentiate, for example, iPS cells with different type of neurons. We always look at what, what the different uh, treatment, what different protocol you use to see what do you get. But in many ways, many of the uh, fundamental outcome are hidden because they already can change but the epigenome or, or transcriptome in, in certain way because of those mechanisms, you don't really see the final product. So everything actually happens much, much earlier than we saw. So this is something uh, we find surprisingly uh, out of this study. Um, I, I mentioned uh, the one phenotype we saw is we think this is uh, the M6A deletion in cortical neurogenesis is due, is due to uh, RNA decay. And, and, and then um, uh, Yung Chao Ma at Northwestern uh, sort of uh, send us an email. They say, well, they also see the similar phenotype as Meta-14 knockout in their uh, model during the study called fmrp one so this is a gene mutated in fragile X. 
So when we, so then eventually we came up together. So we look at the fracture X knockout mice, uh, similarly knockout in the embryonic cortical neurogenesis. We find again the cell cycle exit and cell cycle progression in both of them. I also show the delay, just like the meta protein knockout. So this suggesting could be these two pathways are somehow linked together. And there are also some evidence suggesting that uh, M F MRP1 is also could be M6 reader protein, which means they also can bind M6 A containing RNA. And then uh, when we did the, uh, the binding assay, we find indeed that the M6 A containing uh, uh, and can, can bind to the, um, to the um, fMRP, suggesting fMRP indeed is a, uh, is a reader protein. So now we want to know what is the function of mRP as a reader protein involved in this process. And here, uh, what we did is looking for a nuclear RNA with cytosolic RNA. So basically, we did RNA, uh, RNA sick of the cytosolic uh, and nuclear RNA. And what we find is that many of the RNAs in the nuclear fraction in the NACA animals overlap with M6A, a tagging RNA list we had, I showed you before. There are 800 of them. If you look at many of them, and it's actually here shows the uh, fMRP knockout mice, many of genes in the notch and sonic pathways, they show higher uh, sort of uh, percentage in, in the nucleus fraction. So this is true for both the, the fMRP1 knockout mice and the meta-14 knockout mice. So this is just a normally M6A could be promoting RNA export from the nucleus to cytosol. When you knock out M6A, when knock out its reader protein fMRP1, now they're stuck in the nucleus. So basically, it is involving uh, translocation and uh, export mRNA. And this is involving notch and sonic pathway, which we know are regularly uh, cortical neurogenesis. So for this part, basically, uh, what we'll show you is, is we start with uh, meta-14 knockout, to look at the impact of M6A uh, uh, in, in the uh, embryonic mouse cortical neurogenesis and the human cortical neurogenesis. And what we find is that normally this sort of uh, sequential turnover of mRNA can process leads to sort of sequential step of cortical genesis uh, generate different cortical layers. And now in the knockout animals, everything becomes slower because the RNA becomes decayed much slower. We think what happens is that the, the fate or the state changes become slower. And eventually you need a decay, a sort of delayed cortical neurogenesis. I did not show you the data. What we find is that basically this delayed generation of late uh, uh, sort of up layer cortical neurons there's delayed generation of astrocytes, but they do follow the same pattern. They just, everything becomes slower. So that's the model we start with. We think this is involving our decay. I show you the data this could be involving nuclear export through fMRP. And more recently, Francisca, uh, actually that was a project started when, when she was still with, uh, uh, in my lab and we found M6A also regulating RNA splicing. So, so this could be another mechanism could be involving in regulating many aspects of uh, uh, the cortical neurogenesis. So it's not through one mechanism, but many mechanisms at the same time control the uh, cortical neurogenesis. So this is M6A uh, regulating cortical development. At the same time, we're studying this cortical development, uh, uh, Yilan Wen, now he's uh, a faculty at, in Houston. He was uh, working in Body's lab, looking in uh, axon regeneration, to look at once you damage the peripheral nerve in the peripheral nervous system, and when you have psychiatric nerve injury, what happened to the axon regeneration? Because normally in adult animals, the PS, they can have the effect of axon regeneration. So this part is published. I'm just gonna summarize here. And what he then find that is actually there are two mechanisms involved in both epigenetic and epitranscriptomic mechanism can control this process. So the first step is when you have injury, what happened is you have activation of DNA demacination through the TAT3 complex. So this is a DNA demacination complex that leads to demacination of cytosines in, in the genome, leads to transcription activation of regeneration associated genes. So if you knock down TAT3, for example, you can see this in control case. If you damage, if you cut the stochastic nerve uh, over time in two weeks, they can regenerate uh, the axons. But if you knock down uh, TAT3, now, to block the DND methylation, you can regeneration is, is, is uh, delayed. In the second phase, not only you can induce the expression of regeneration associated genes, and these genes can be rapidly translated into proteins. And we don't find that many of these regeneration associated genes actually are M6 attacked. And this can be if you block the M6A by either knockout meta 14 or knockout is another reader protein instead of YTHDF2. 
uh, in this case, we knock out YTHDF1, and this is a reader involving protein translation. And he find both by knockout meta protein or knockout YTHDF1, you can see in these animals, the, uh, the PNS exon regeneration is greatly delayed. So in this case, it's a, it's a, uh, again, it's, so the M6A can regulate uh, tagging different, uh, different mRNA and regulating protein differently. And in this case, it's not RNA decay, but instead protein, uh, protein translation. So this is really is an injury condition, is sort of a pathological condition. We also look into the physiological condition. And this is a collaboration with Chuan He in Chicago, is, as well as Tao Zhu in uh, Shanghai Tech uh, University. In this case, we look at in the hippocampus in adult animals and look at learning memory. And what they find is that if you knock out, uh, I'm not showing you here for meta three or meta 14, but instead of showing you data for the DF1, which is the reader protein involving protein translation, we find that if you knock out or knock down YTHDF1, and these animals has deficits in learning memory in terms of uh, spatial water maze learning memory, uh, uh, contextual uh, field condition uh, memory, as well as long-term potentiation in, in terms of synaptic physiology. So in this case, again, is, is M, uh, we also sequence M16 tag transcripts, and we find many of them are involved in synaptic plasticity and learning memory. Just to summarize all this part together, and uh, basically we show you here, is really it is a cell type specific and stage dependent M6A uh, landscape in neurons, and, and they have different functions. And during cortical neurogenesis, uh, the genes tagged by M6A, many of them are involved in cell cycle, neurogenesis, and, and these are involved in RNA turnovers, uh, RNA stability, nuclear export, as well as splicing. But in adult animals, it seems to be the major function is involving protein translation in two different contexts. In the context of uh, 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 brain uh, sort of uh, axonal injuries, you basically you can see the injury can induce tremendous uh, uh, de novo protein synthesis, and this is promoted by M6A tagging. When you knock on M6A, and the de novo protein synthesis, you can see the band here is really reduced. Uh, so it's also true this is involving uh, learning and memory. So this is really, uh, we still, uh, still are learning how this MCC can work in different contexts. In the lab, we study this in other contexts, for example, in, in uh, hypothalamus uh, uh, development and uh, in uh, neurodegeneration as well. So, so there are a, a number of study ongoing show that if you knock out MCC, uh, either writer or reader proteins, you have a different impact in different cell types at different stages. Now I want to turn to, uh, uh, in the last uh, 20 minutes also, I'll turn uh, sort of to another different modification. In this case is a modification of TRAs. The TRAs are important because they are involved in protein translation. And the TRA is, uh, there are many, many different type modifications of TRA at a very characteristically different size. This M1G, uh, uh, many different M1A, are different, many different sites can be modified at defined location. So these are involving either pairing effect or structure or detection of tRNA. And today I'm going to tell you uh, one of the modifications is on the 32 position of tRNA, and this is M3C uh, modification. And there are multiple M3C uh, method transferase. Uh, two of them uh, is well characterized as meta-2 and the meta-6. So this is different than meta-3 and the meta-14. And these two are involved in cytosolic, uh, cytoplasmic tRNA M3C modification. There's another one with uh, uh, method transferase called the meta H. And this one is a little bit controversial because uh, people uh, sort of their conflict report. Some reports say uh, meta H is a cytosolic uh, uh, tRNA uh, sort of uh, uh, meta uh, transferase can modify mRNA in, 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 the, in the cytoplasmic regions. That report suggesting meta H could be a mitochondrial tRNA modifiers, which can modify tRNA uh, in the mitochondrial. But also, there are reports that meta H can, can be involved in nucleolus uh, in, in the nucleus, have other functions. So, the study, the meta H function, uh, so all, uh, again, all early studies was done in the cell lines, mostly cancer cell lines, immortalized cell lines. We want to study this in the intact animals. So, uh, Feng Zhang, a, a, a poster in the lab, did is we knock out this gene in, in the uh, developing embryos using. Uh, Condition knockout mice. So he again used a nesting driver, cross with flocks, meta eight mouse, and look at what happened in cortical genesis in vivo. And here, look at a, a postnatal P0, and what he find is that uh, basically, if you stay for markers with different cortical layers, and you basically one thing you notice is that the upper layer neurons uh, labeled by Cox1, 
is much less <coughs> compared to the wild type, suggesting there's some kind of deficit in generating late born neurons in cortical neurogenesis, uh, upper neurons. So now this led us to see is could be the deficit is also early in the de uh, uh, in cortical development. So the first step is try to identify where matter eight is localized. Are they in the cytosol? Are they in the mitochondria? So here it just shows basically he, he, uh, he uh, look at the matter eight expression, and what he finds is he's staying with the markers of mitochondria, uh, <coughs> uh, mitochondrial one, and he basically find it really matter eight well localized in the mitochondrial markers. So basically suggesting matter eight could be a mitochondrial protein. So they are really uh, evolving mitochondrial. The second is we want to know where are the uh, M3C modifications are located in the genome. So we performed the first one, we performed genome-wide analysis called M3C, <coughs> M3C uh, hexic. So this one is really based on the, the knowledge that if you treat the RNA with a uh, agent, <coughs> which can clip the RNA at the site where you have, mod, uh, you have M3C modification. So basically if you have M3C modification and the, the, uh, the, the chemical reaction is gonna cut them make a break at this site. Now, if you take the whole genome RNA, including all the tRNAs and uh, mRNAs, and then you treat them to break the site, then when you make the library, what happens is basically when you sequence them, you see enrichment of uh, this starting codon in your RNA transcript. So this we can tell where they are. So we did this genome-wide. And basically, if you look at genome-wide analysis, we only found one site which has shown the significance across the genome, uh, across the corrected uh, uh, the, uh, the statistics. And basically, this is a mitochondrial tRNA screening uh, tRNA. So you can see here in the, in the water animals, and basically you can see really they start on this particular uh, T after the C. So this C is modified. So the transcript really have a very clear study inside. There's nothing here. If you knock out this uh, modification, you can see the studies that can be anywhere. So basically, there's no preference for the break at this site. So this really only identify one site with genome-wide significance. There's a second site also shows some hint, but it does not reach genome-wide significance. This also is a, a mitochondrial tRNA, is a serine tRNA in the genome. So this is a genome-wide analysis. And we also want to confirm this result with a different approach. So in this case, we take advantage of another property of M3 modification, which is you can block the reverse transcription. So basically, if you have primer to look at reverse transcription, and when you have the modification, it blocks there. So you cannot extend beyond. So you basically, if you have modification, you generate a short fragment. If you don't have the modification, you can generate long fragment. And when we use the PCR to measure the short and long fragment, we can look at the ratio of this. So in this, we use a targeted approach. We'll look at all the tRNAs in the mitochondrial, as well as the cytosolic tRNA, which has been identified in other cell lines to be M3C modified. And basically, we find that uh, in the knockout case, uh, in knockout uh, meta-8, uh, only two M uh, M3C show differences. One is, is the tRNA screening, as we identified in whole genome uh, sequencing. <laughs> the second one is the uh, serine, where we show a hint of modification. And you can see, really, the serine has very dramatic effect, and the screening has a mild effect. And <clears throat> we confirm these two modifications also affected in knockout animals in the in vivo, by looking at E13.5, a, a postnatal brain, you can see there's differences in the ratio of these two fragments. <clears throat> so basically, this identifies uh, meta 8 most likely to be a tRNA, a <clears throat> mitochondrial tRNA message transferase uh, in, in the neural stem cell. <clears throat> then, what we did is looking for what's the functional consequence. And so here, what Fung did is the RNA sick analysis of the wild type and NACA uh, neural stem cell in the dish. And basically, you find many of the differential express genes. If you look at the differential express genes, majority of them, many of them are linked to mitochondrial oxidative, uh, oxidative phosphorylation, mitochondrial properties. So these are really uh, consistent with both the immunostaining data showing that meta-8 is a mitochondrial protein, as well as the sequence data showing that M3C modification in, in M8 dependent, meta-8 dependent fashion happens only on mitochondrial TRA. So of course, the TRNA involving protein translation. So this led us looking for what are the impact on protein translation in the wild type and knock animals. So here, basically, what he did is looking for mitochondrial encode genes. So those are genes encoded by the mitochondrial genome. So they are translated in the mitochondria themselves. So this is a, a mitochondrial one. 
And what he finds is that compared to wild type and knock animals, you can see this protein are uh, really reduced in the abundance, suggesting the mitochondrial proteins are lower in the knock animals. We can show this by immunohistology as well as by Western blocks. So now we look at three different genes encoded by mitochondrial, suggesting these are reduced in the knock animals. So they make less mitochondrial protein, or at least the level of mitochondrial protein are lower. To ensure really the de novo uh, uh, synthesis of protein or translation is reduced. He did a labeling assay. So basically, you can use uh, uh, amino acid uh, analogs to label the, um, the newly synthesized RNA, the newly synthesized protein. So we can do this in the presence of inhibition of cytosolic protein translation using cytohexamide. So here, basically, all the labeling of protein translated in the mitochondrial. And you, show, you can see here, really, it's very specific uh, colloquialized the mitochondrial proteins. And you can see in the wild type of knock animals, in the knockout animals, the labeling is much, much weaker. And we can show this at genome-wide level. If you look at mitochondrial protein translation, and, and in the presence of inhibition of cytosolic protein translation, you can see the knockout animals, this is greatly reduced. On the other hand, if you block the mitochondrial protein uh, translation, look at the cytosolic protein translation, you can see they're very, very similar. So again, it shows the specificity. This is involved in uh, protein translation in mitochondria. So next, we want to know what's the functional consequence of reduced protein translation in mitochondrial. So here, uh, Fung did a seahorse assay to look at oxidation, uh, oxygen usage. And basically, what he finds is that the, uh, the, the basal respiration, ATP linked respiration, maximum respiration, uh, all of them are decreased in the, in the knock animals, suggesting reduction of mitochondrial functions. To show this is indeed due to mitochondrial uh, function, he used a drug, so this is a, a, a drug, uh, has been used actually as FDA approved drugs. This drug enhances respiration function of mitochondrial. The mechanism is not quite clear. And you can see basically in the, in the, uh, in the uh, white type animals, if you treat it with this uh, white type cells, if you treat it with drug, you can, rush, you can enhance the, the, uh, the respiration function. Then in the knockout animals, uh, you can see you can rescue them to wild type level. So this link together, the deficit is really due to uh, mitochondrial function. So looking for functional consequences, he, again, he used the cell culture system to see what happens uh, to uh, differentiation. So in this case, he has a cell culture where under these culture cell conditions, the neural stems are going to either maintain neural stem cell free or they can differentiate into neurons. So these have been marked by nesting or DCX. And what you can see here in the knockout animals, you actually have less nesting positive cells, you have more DCX positive cells, suggesting with the deficits of mitochondrial function, you, you balance towards a, a differentiation instead of maintenance of neural stem cells. And we can show this effect uh, is actually this. So this is loss function analysis. We can show this directly by blocking a, a mitochondrial translation. You can get the same effect. So we use the drug uh, CAP, which block mitochondrial protein translation. You can feel this actually can mimic the effect of meta knockout mice. Where similarly, you see a decrease in the neural stem cell state. You see increase uh, of uh, um, neural differentiation. So this is all in vitro. You also want to look at in vivo. Now go back to in vivo now. We're looking for what happened to neural stem cells and neurogenesis. And here it just shows over time, you can see if you look at on the wild type animals over this course from E13.5 to E16.5, you see a gradual decrease of PAC6 plus of neural stem cells. So that's the normal depletion of neural stem cells during the course of cortical neurogenesis. But in the knockout animals, you can see at every single stage, the number of uh, PAC6 positive neural stem cells are reduced, suggesting there's a deficit in maintaining neural stem cells, but potentially can promote a, a, a neurogenesis. And you can see, basically, we see an increase of TBR2 over time. To show this more directly, uh, he actually labeled cohort neural stem cells directly using urethral electrification. So basically, using urethral electrification to label the cells at E11.5. And then we look at, uh, at uh, he, he look at cell, uh, label the cells at E13.5. Then look at E15.5, then you can quantify all the green cells to see what the state they are. And basically, what we find is that in the NACA animals, you can see this greatly reduced or PAXA positive neural stem cells. And this follows with the increase of double quartin positive neurons. So, this is very similar to the in vivo conditions. And importantly, what you find is that if you use the, the drug, the mitochondrial enhancing drug, we can rescue the phenotype. So, basically, now using the NACA animals with the drug, you can see. Uh, the, the neural stem cell is maintained, the neurogenesis is also balanced in this case.
And so what's the fun functional consequence of this? And we think what happens is, is if you uh, deplete neural stem cell early, and then that will lead to a decreased number of neural stem cells for later generation of uh, upper layer cortical neurons. So that's indeed the case. And what we find is that this precocious neurogenesis early on, and that's why you see in the knocker animals, you see more deep layer neurons, typically positive neurons, but later on, you can see in our later stage, uh, 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 so this is EDU labeled cells, E15.5, now you can see uh, the generation of up layer neurons, including CEP2 and COX1 neurons and DPOs. So basically you have a switch. You generate more uh, uh, deep layer neurons, but you generate less of up layer neurons. So all this was done in, in, uh, in the mouse. Again, we want to look at what happens in, in humans. We'll return to the four brain organoid model. So phone data is we generate isogenic lines. We knock out the matter eight in the IPSL lines then we generate organoids. So again, we started with the, our organoid protocols uh, and to generate uh, so this uh, sort of uh, dual somatic inhibition and, and then with uh, wind activation to enhance the uh, neurogenesis, uh, neural stem cell amplification that eventually we look at cortical uh, development. And basically again, we find that in the human organoids, we see the similarly, the serining and, and the serine uh, modifications are, are, are M6A modified. And then when we look at the mitochondrial proteins is also decreased in the uh, four brain organoids, both by immunostating and the Western blot. And finally, we're looking for what happens to the impacts on uh, um, sort of uh, stem cell maintenance and cortical neurogenesis. And in this case, what phone did is he used retrovirus injected in the lumen to label neural stem cells then follow them to see what the fate of uh, these cells. So this is very similar to what he did with neutral electrification in the mouse model. And basically, what we find that during this two weeks time point, you find in the compared to the wild type uh, isogenic iPSL lines, the four brain organoid generated from the knockout animals, uh, knockout uh, organoid uh, iPSLs show decrease of stem cell numbers and they show increase of neurons. And this effect can be rescued by the drug treatment with, uh, with the mitochondrial enhancing drugs. And he did this with three different uh, knockout clones and four different wild type clones. So, together, just to summarize this part, uh, what we see what happens is, is meta, meta 8 uh, can specifically master the M3C in the mitochondrial in the neural stem cells. And this allowed uh, uh, the, the, sort of the mitochondrial function to generate uh, de novo, uh, the promoting protein translation, uh, maintain the mitochondrial function. And when this is, uh, is disrupted, and now you, what you have is you have decreased mitochondrial function. That leads to imbalance of uh, neural stem cell maintenance and the neurogenesis. Basically, this uh, leaning towards uh, more neurogenesis but less of stem cell maintenance. As a consequence, you generate more uh, early bone neurons but less later bone neurons. And all this are uh, uh, mediated by the mitochondrial function because we can rescue this effect by the mitochondrial enhancing drug. And we show this both in the mouse brain as well as in four brain organoids. Just uh, sort of put all things together for these two parts. And basically, I, I give you examples how uh, RNA modification can have a diverse function and mechanism in the nervous system. I give you an example in the cortical neurogenesis where M6 regulation can control the tempo of embryonic cortical genesis. And this involves multiple mechanisms. It can be involving of RNA decay through the readers of YTHD2, you can export through the readers of uh, fMRP. And it also can be involved in splicing, and we don't know the readers of that yet. Secondly, I go uh, summarize the study to show that in the now nervous system, this can be involving uh, M6A dependent protein translation through the reader of YTHTF1 uh, instead of TF2. And finally, I show you the M3C modification can control cortical neurogenesis, uh, neurogenesis and through mitochondrial uh, modification and the translation and the function. So you have the people who did the work. Uh, so the work started with uh, Ki Jung Yong. Now he has his own lab at Akaist. Uh, Francesca did all the sequencing for M6A during cortical neurogenesis. And now she's uh, at uh, um, uh, Munich. I think she actually is starting her own lab moving to Penn State um, this year. Uh, Caroline uh, was a student in the lab and now she's a faculty at the UCSF. Yilan Wen did all the excellent regeneration work and now he's at Houston. A phone is still posting the lab, and this is together with Guli and from his lab. And here are the support. Thank you.